God bless you. Good morning, Miss Beck. Good morning, Auntie Pope. Dorothy Pope, God bless all of you and welcome. So why is this message important? Uh, all my life, I have been deemed as anointed and gifted. Let's go back first to gifting. Uh, at the age of seven, you know, a singer, a drummer, uh, as I've gotten older, hey, Jennifer, uh, play six different instruments, you know, both lead bass guitar, organ, keyboard, saxophone, drums. I sing, I write. There's a lot of gifting that God has given me. And then um, all my life, I've been gifted to see in the spirit. Didn't realize it as until I got older and got an understanding that I was gifted with uh, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. And then his anointing is what makes the gifts amplify to the world. And so this morning when I woke up, God spoke to me that a lot of people uh, not gifted. Thank you for sharing, Teresa. Thank you for sharing, Christy. Uh, God said a lot of people are not anointed, that, that many are simply gifted. And when he spoke it into my spirit, it brought back the scripture over in Psalms uh, 105, Psalm 150 vision in verse 15. And many people use this scripture out of context, and sometimes many people use it for whatever point they want to make. But when God spoke it to my spirit, I heard you know people, people saying so many times, uh, God can't use anything dirty. God will not use anything unclean. God won't even touch anything unclean. And when I heard that scripture, that, 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 that statement over the years, it troubles me because he's used many things that are unclean. He's used many things that are dirty, including me and you, because we're not always clean. We're not always perfecting and, and have God uh, uh, holding us on us. There are times where the word of God says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But yet he still uses us because first of all, his gifting is what he's given us to be a blessing to this world. And then the anointing, those that are anointed are now still on point, although you may have gone astray. So when someone says God can't use anything unclean, it bothers me because a lot of people who are truly anointed by God are looked down upon because quote unquote, they don't meet the standards of what it means to be holy or clean or righteous. Well, if that's the case, none of us do. Because sometimes I tell people when, when behind closed doors, that's the real you. Whether or not you're holy or anointed, that's, not, that's for God to determine. And some people have mastered the acting of being anointed. But God said it was simply gifting. So let's get into it today. Uh, the 150 vision of Psalms. This message is going to bless many. It's going to anger many. But it's going to do what God called it to do, which is to free you. Okay, one thing about the way life center, we're not here to make friends. We don't do that. We're simply here to give you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth that free you from the bondages of life. So here in the 150 vision of Psalm, verse 15, simply, I'm going to, go, I'm going to read 15 through 22. And it says, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. Now we heard many say, touch not mine anointed. And they'll say, you're putting your mouth on me. Uh, first of all, no, I'm not putting my mouth on you. That's a fear tactic that, that many people use to keep you off of them when you speak the truth about them. And so what I've come to understand is that touch not my anointed ones. And he said, my anointed preacher. There's a lot of people that God have anointed that people are touching because they don't look the part. I wish someone would say amen and share that heart, right, some hearts right there. People have put you down and said that you're not God's vessel because you don't quote the, quote, the, quote the scriptures a certain way or you don't shout a certain way or you don't hiccup a sigh a certain way or you don't lay hands a certain way. And so you're not anointed. But God simply said to David in this word here, do not touch my anointed ones, which means it's not a title that makes you anointed. It is simply the anointing of God on your life to do a purpose. And with that being said, most people who are anointed are hidden. We saw that in the case of David. When David was anointed to be the king, he was anointed, but he was not king after his anointing. He was actually anointed and then went back to his regular life. What are you saying, Kerry? Many of you watching me right now are anointed by God, but it's not your time for the anointing to come forward. So does that mean I'm not anointed? No, you're still anointed. Your anointing has not been activated. Oh, somebody better hear me. And so when God activates your anointing, then you will be able to walk forward and you won't look the part, but you'll do the part. Let me give you an example. 
when David was anointed to be king, when Solomon, when, when, Sam, when Samuel came in and, didn't, and David's father figured that the other brothers looked the part to be the king of Israel. But David was outside tending the sheep and he was outside, you know, watching over them. And then Samuel says, uh, but this is not the one. There is a, this is not the one that God's anointed. Is there another one? See, when you are anointed, you don't have to tell people you're anointed. God will always have you hidden until it's time for you to come forward. Thank you, Holy Ghost. And so when he anoints you to come forward, the provision will be made and the timing will be in place for you to step in. David's outside stinking, looking dirty and nasty because he's doing his job. What are you saying, Carrie? Many of you watching me right now don't look the part, don't smell the part, don't talk the part, but you are the part because now God is beginning to open up and it's time for you to come forward. See, he was a gifted shepherd boy, but it was time for him to be anointed to be a king. What he said, your gifts and your talents will make room for you. David's gifting and his talents as a shepherd boy, being able to, to kill a bear, to kill a lion, able to do what he had to do to protect the sheep, allowed him to be able to protect the kingdom. What are you saying? Do you mean to tell me my, my, my low, low position, quote unquote, as people seem to think I am, or if I don't have the education or I don't have the look, or I don't have the years of experience. Does that negate me from my anointing or my calling? No. What it actually does is keep you in a pure state of not being corrupted with the positions. Oh, my goodness. Because once you become anointed as a prophet or as an apostle, or as a preacher, whatever it may be, in the, in the eyes of people, there's a certain expectation that comes with it. What I love about David's anointing is David had no expectation. He was only expected to look dirty and to protect the sheep, right? All right, so let's keep going. So do not touch my anointed one. Do my prophets no harm. Now, I want you to share this because somebody needs to hear this message this morning. He, in verse 16, it says, he called down famine on the land and destroyed all their supplies of food. And he sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. So Joseph, as, as David's talking about here, Joseph, uh, actually Samuel, I mean Solomon, Joseph is not a titled boy. He was just a simple boy around the age of 10 or 11 that had a vision. He had a vision and a dream, and he shared this dream with his father. And, and his father, uh, Isaac, uh, uh, um, Isaac said, oh, uh, uh, um, don't, I'm sorry, uh, um, I forgot Joseph's father that quick. Joseph's father said, don't even repeat that. Don't repeat the fact that you have a dream because your dream is very prophetic and your dream is anointed. And so Bible says that, and he destroyed all the supplies of food and he sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons till what he foretold came to pass. What are you saying, Carrie? If you're drunk and you give a word from God, it will come to pass if God said it. Not the state of what you said it in, because when Joseph uh, said his state, he said it in shackles. He said it in bondage. He said it in jail. What are you saying, Carrie? People want to judge your word based on your credentials. People want to judge your word based on your look. But I'm going to tell you something. There are a lot of men and women of God that don't look the part that are speaking exactly what God is saying. And then you're listening to the ones who don't have a clue what God's voice sound like. Oh my, I, I, I'm just being real with you today. I love it when I don't have any notes. I love it when I can just turn on the, turn on the, the, the screen and just speak to you because what God is saying, so many are simply gifted, but not anointed. And some don't even have the gift. Some have the gift of know-how. And they've mastered it. How to? That's why the Bible said, "Beware of sheep and wolves' clothing." Be, 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 beware of wolves and sheep's clothing. There are a lot of wolves that are standing up on Sunday morning pulpit this morning, taking up offerings, saying, "Thus said the Lord." And people are so gullible because they're so hungry for the Word of God that what they're calling anointed is only simply know how. And so we must come to understand this: you must know the truth and know the whole truth and know who God is. And in knowing who God is, you won't fall for the okadoke dope from the ones who have no clue what thus said the Lord is. I heard a preacher yesterday, made me sick to my stomach, said, the Lord said that deliverance is coming to the room. I said, okay, keep going. And all you lift your hands right now, and 30 of you are going to get it. And I said, oh, okay, 
what else? What else is God saying? He said, that's all I hear God say. And I said, dude, shut up. Because if that's all you hear God say, then my baby girl who's 13 can say the same thing. My, my, my grandson who was four or three can say the same thing. What are you saying, Carrie? If God said something, he's going to give you a direct word of knowledge and wisdom. He's not going to give you some general prophecy that can fit anything in the room. One size fit all. No, when God speaks, God is direct. God is precise. God is on point. And we have fallen for the okadote because people are so gullible that they don't understand something that is gifted versus something that is anointed. And then they don't understand that something that they call anointed or not even gifted or anointed. It's just simply con artist 101. The other night when I was inside of the coach consortium and I began to pray over one, God had me to speak directly into the lives of the people. I didn't give general prophecies. I gave them the past, the present, and the future because I am truly a prophet anointed of God to speak. So I don't have to give general. What are you saying, Carrie? Stop falling for people who just give you general prophecy because they can't go any deeper than that. And then you say, what well, the man of God or the woman of God said, no, you got to get out of that mess and say, what did God say? say. Because anybody can give you a general prophecy. I can tell you that it might rain tomorrow and it might not. I could be 50-50, baby. Come on. But can you be 100? Many people have confused the anointing of God with a gift and even sometimes a gift with just know-how. I've sat back and watched people go to sleep in church when a man of God is teaching, but the moment he goes, and uh, I heard somebody say, ah. everybody's like, yeah, you better preach, man of God. And I went, wait a minute, he's singing now. He's not preaching. He's singing a message. See, we got to get out of emotionalism and come to the understanding of what is truly anointed. What is truly anointed from God? Because God doesn't come in all the flashes and the thunder and the lightning. No, no, no. Anointing comes in a still, peaceful way that brings peace to a chaotic situation. <laughs> when you walk in the room and chaos is going on because of the anointing that you carry for a specific job or purpose that God has for you, the atmosphere has to shift because you have stepped on the scene. Ah, my, my. So with that being said, let me continue reading. He says, they bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put with irons and till his four, till what he foretold came to pass, till the words of the Lord proved him true. So what are you saying? Many people will call you false or pay you no attention until your words come true. Then they're going to say, oh, you said that. But they still don't understand that you said it because you were anointed. You just got lucky. See, he said until his word proved him true. Verse 20, the king sent and released him. The rulers of the people set him free. He made him master over his household and a ruler over all that he possessed. Verse 22, to instruct his princes as the pleased band teaches his wisdom to elders. What are you saying, Carrie? When, when, get, when we get in this word in Psalms 105, it's simply saying that the anointing does not look anointed. That the anointing isn't about what the purpose is that God has for someone's life and that it has been fulfilled. So let's talk about it. What does it mean to be anointed? In this day and age, if you're going to say someone is anointed, most times back in the day, it means they had about six uh, quarts of oil that was poured from the crown of someone's head and went all the way down to their feet. Even in Psalms, it talks about the oil running down the beard of Aaron all the way down to his feet. Now, we don't drench people anymore in oil, although I have seen some events where people have drenched them in oil and poured oil on them, and yeah. I was like, okay, y'all taking a little bit too far now. We're not back in that day. You know, we can anoint today without putting all the oil on people. <laughs> but, but let's keep it real here. And so in the anointing today, anointing simply means being set aside for a purpose being set aside for a purpose. We see that again with Joseph. We see that again with David, being set aside for a purpose. So most of us are anointed actually from our mother's womb is when we can read that over it. I think it's Jeremiah, he says, you anointed me from my mother's womb. Many times we are anointed at birth for a purpose. 
Uh, that's why it's really important, and I, I really pray and teach this, that when you're born, to have your life prayed over and dedicated back to God, which means set aside for whatever God's purpose is over your life. So as you get older, that, you know, this inside of you will always come back to pass and your purpose for existence will manifest as you get older. So with that being said, God anoints us in our youth. Okay, I want you to get that. He anoints you in your youth. And as you get older, your purpose for existence is now going to come forward. So it's not about just putting oil upon your forehead because I don't read in here where David had oil put on his head. Although, I, I'm sorry, not David, but uh, Joseph. Joseph had a dream. Joseph was set aside and sold as a slave. But his dream got him to the palace. Uh, Moses, Moses was a criminal. But Moses was actually anointed in the wilderness in the front of the burning bush. That's when he was really anointed, if you want to be honest about it. But he had a calling on his life the moment he was put in the, in, in the Nile River and found by the daughter Pharaoh. Uh, so with that being said, uh, Pharaoh's sister, Lord, forgive me, my mind is blank this moment, but you know what I'm talking about. But he found him there. So what are you saying, Carrie? Can I be anointed even in my foolishness and in my mess? God had a purpose for you when he birthed you. And your mess did not negate your purpose. I'll smile on that one. Carrie, can you prove that? What do you mean my mess did not negate my purpose? Because gifts come without repentance and they are they're, they're, they're irro uh, irrevocable. You cannot, uh, I hate this word because it's one of my key words I love to say. I got a friend of mine, her key word is brewery. They're, they're, you can't reverse it. I'll use it that way. They're irrevocable. That's it, irrevocable. You cannot reverse what God has already ordained. And because of the simple fact that you are born for a purpose and your gifts come without repentance, his purpose over your life is irrevocable. Meaning that people may revoke you, that people may get rid of you, but the gift that God has in your life is never revocable. What are you saying, Carrie? Do you mean to tell me that if I'm a, if I see in the spirit and I get drunk, I'm still going to see in the spirit? The gift is irrevocable. You mean to tell me that I could sit in jail, look at somebody and prophesy to them and tell them exactly what's going to happen, although I'm a criminal just like them? The gift is irrevocable. But see, people want to tell you to do your first works over again, but my first works was simply to be who I am. So what you're telling me to do is just simply be who God called me to be. And that's the problem. You must stop running from who you are and simply be and stop letting people have the power to tell you what you are and what you're not. I am anointed, have been anointed, and when I die, I'll stay anointed. All right? All right? If I could just keep it real with you, it's not my anointing didn't come because I got right with God. No, my purpose began to come forward as I began to do more of what God had for me to do. All right. I was prophesying in middle school and in elementary school. Didn't realize it. I was telling the teacher what the Lord said. Didn't know I was the Lord was saying it. I just had an idea what I heard in my mind and I said it. But that's God speaking. And as I got older, I began to get more knowledge and understanding of how to apply it and to use it. But then sometimes in learning how to apply it and use it, you can get put in a system of ex expectations and how to use it and how to say it. And unless you say, thus said the Lord, well, a lot of times you can just say what you got to say. And people know the Lord is saying it because it's resonating in their spirit. You don't have to put on the end, thus said the Lord, for it to be true. You can just say what thus said the Lord, and it is true because God is speaking through you. All right. We have a tendency to say, thus said the Lord or whatever, as a way of saying, receive it, it comes from God. But the people listening know that God is speaking because there's no way you should know this about me. Mm. So there's a scripture <clears throat> in Romans 11, 28 and 30, 32 that says, as far as the gospel is concerned, they are the enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, meaning call for a purpose, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. They're irrevocable. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God, have now received the mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may receive the mercy as a result, as a result of God's mercy upon you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience. Wait a minute now. This is all for the, the let me get a sip of my coffee. Because this is for the righteous who said, I don't sin. And you like to judge everybody. The word of God says in verse 32 of Romans, Paul said, for God has bound everyone over to disobedience. Mm. 
God has bound everyone over to disobedience. That simply means that God has turned everyone over to be disobedient. If that's what I understand it. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. But there's going to be a time when the very anointed are going to be disobedient. But it doesn't mean that their gift or their anointing is going to leave them. It means that God's going to give them mercy in their disobedience. See, that's what God has said is missing in the kingdom today is mercy. There's judgment. There's judgmental people. There's people that has a hell already for you to be put in. We must stop this foolishness and put everybody in hell except for the ones who look the part, sound the part, shout the part, speak the part. They're going to be the ones holding the door and the gate open to hell because they're faking it. But the ones that are true, if you are alcoholic, but yet you're, you've been true to who you are, God can use you better than somebody that's faking it. And hide behind closed doors. Why? Because even in the, in the midst of you being drunk, your words will pierce the heart of those that hear it because God can use an ass. He can use anything. He spoke to you. I'm just keeping it real with you. Read the word of God when he spoke to the ass and told him, don't you see these people in front of us? God is simply saying today, stop letting people put you in a shell and stop your gifts and anointing for being used because you don't look the part. Do you not know that God has called us outside the four walls that many of you are gifted and anointed for business, that you have ideas and insight and oversight that nobody else has thought about? And it's just not because you're lucky or good. It's because God anointed you from your birth for business. That's why you don't have to go to business school for it. Look at Bill Gates, dropped out of college, but he was anointed to make technology. God gave him an idea. He wasn't somewhere uh, having to go to school and learn this stuff. It was in him. And here's Microsoft. Let's talk about my boy, Bill Gates, who I love dearly. Another dropout. Here's school. But what is the big deal? School is not going to get me what I need because what I have is a gift from God that would never be given away, but never be taken away because he birthed me for this purpose. He birthed me to birth Apple Inc. What did God anoint you and birth you for? What did God set you aside to do? But you, you see, but I got to go to school for this and I got to go to school for that. No, baby, you just need to be what God called you to be and allow what you have to popularize this world with it. See, we, 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 we're too busy trying to copy what man say is the way to get it. Because what I'm looking at in history, most of my billionaires that I read all had a gift. Eh, come on, somebody. And really, to be honest with you, if the anointing is something to set you aside for a purpose, then they were anointed to bring change in this world with their very technology and gifts that they birthed. See, we don't want to think about anointing like that. We just want to think about it as simply being at church, running around, laying hands, singing a song to make people move and fall out. No, baby. Anointing is being set aside for a specific purpose, and your purpose is going to bring about change or shift to this world. I wish somebody would say amen and talk to me this morning because that's where we're getting messed up. Many of you right now have so many gifting inside. So, so like, as I said, many are simply gifted, not anointed, but here's the key. It's your anointing that amplifies your gift so that when you do it, let me give you a good example. All right. Let's talk about professional basketball. For example, let me just go there. We remember when uh, Julius Irving, was the man. We remember when Walt Chamberlain was the man. But then as we fast forward, here comes Magic Johnson, gifted, doing what he does, changed the era of basketball. But then after him came Michael Jordan, gifted, changed the area of basketball. Let's bring about the next person, Kobe Bryant, gifted, changed the atmosphere of basketball. Now we have LeBron James, gifted, shifted, changed the culture of basketball. But here's something that nobody ever talks about. And here's why I say the anointing comes in, because I remember Michael Jordan was being cut from this basketball from the middle school basketball team. But yet, because of the anointing on his life, he had to still be who he was. So he went to high school, went to North Carolina, went to Chicago. Now he's known as the GOAT, the greatest of all times. Kobe Bryant never went to college, came straight from high school, went straight to the pros, set records, won NBA titles, known as also one of the greatest of all times. But then he passed the torch on to LeBron James, who never went to college, who came straight out of high school, went to the pros. What are you saying, Kerry? God's gift does not need man's approval. It just needs you to act 
activate it because the anointing activates your gifts. You just need to simply activate. What are you anointed to do this morning? What are you gifted to do? Because you may say, well, God, I'm gifted, but the anointing hadn't kicked in yet. Good. Operating your gifts until it kicks in. <laughs> the anointing is what destroys the yokes. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke of poverty. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke of ignorance. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke of being, you know, you know uh, have a stigma over you as only being such and such and such and such. What are you saying? See, when Michael Jordan came on the scene, he shifted the culture, but he also influenced a lot of young kids that you too can be a dropout, so to say, a cut from the team, but yet still achieve greatness. Why is this important? Because what about your past? Is it that God can use as your gifting come forward and then he anoints it or activates it to change this world? Meaning when Kobe Bryant died, he was very influential in changing the culture throughout the world. He was more known internationally than he was nationally. What are you saying? It was God's anointing and his gifting that had him shift in another country. Can you be so influential to the world that in another country, you're greater there than you are in your own? The word of God clearly told us that a prophet's not even honored in his own country. That includes gifted ones. So most times we only look at prophets or apostles or gifted people or anointed people in church. But there are people anointed in business, in sports, in acting. That's why they can come up and act and you feel it because they have what it takes to touch you. Not that they're just good, but there's some people that can sit before a camera. I was told that I could sit in front of a camera and talk to people and I just have it. They said, I was told by a professional person in, in the um in the news field that I have what many people train to get and I have it naturally, the ability to connect. That when I look in a camera, something about me connects with those that are listening and it makes them tune in to see what I'm saying. I didn't go to school for that. I just simply turn on the camera one day and say, hello. And, but it's because of my anointing and gifting that God has called me to do. It's what makes people gravitate. So what are you saying, Carrie? What gifts do you have inside that you're not utilizing because you've been told God can't use a dirty vessel? I'll wait. I want to know. I want to know what operating gifts inside of you have you allowed to become stagnant and stale. And I'm waiting for us to get fresh anointings because the word of God lets us know that fresh anointing is what we need. It's in Psalms as well. Fresh anointing. Meaning that your gifts need to be refreshed with a greater anointing. There are a lot of people standing up right now saying, lift your hands with a stellar anointing. And it's to the point where even the kids know how stellar it is because they looked upon and saw that the expiration date has been and gone. <laughs> so when the kids can start reciting what you're saying, the expiration of your anointing needs to be refreshed, renewed. Come on, somebody. That's why the old tactics aren't working in this era. We're in the 21st century era. You can't use 20th century technology or 20th century ways. You got to adapt with time. And you know what? What's funny is everything is changing except the church. They don't want to adapt to what God is doing. They want to continue to use old tactics and say, this is the only way God comes. And God is saying, you guys are not even seeing that half of what you call anointed is just simply gifted. But the ones that are truly gifted and anointed can see it. And if I can be honest with you, here's the key. Technology has allowed us to press a button and be everywhere at any given time. Omnipotent. All present. All powerful. All knowing because you have access to everything. But here's the question. Are you using it to do what God called you to do? Are you using the gifts that God has given you to better the lives of someone else? And then the anointing that God activates your gifts, amplifies it to go even deeper to the core and the soul of a man. It's important to know this because God is saying, I'm trying to shift but the body doesn't want to shift because you've been told that if anything outside of this comes to reject it, it only accept this that lines up with every scripture that was told. Well, I'm going to be very, very honest with you. Very, very honest with you. Very, very, very honest with you. When you read the Bible, if you read it as a book that it is, it gives you great wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. 
But when you try to duplicate something that the people would be, see, the people in the Bible were being authentic, meaning they were living their lives and God spoke. When you learn to be authentic as they were, God will speak to you in the same manner and you can write some things or your appetite can be written about what this person was and how they were and what God did and how he used them. But when we get so caught up in God told Peter, God told Paul, but what did God tell you? Because their lives and their reputation is solid. But what about you? And I do know for a fact that whatever God does take me from this world, that my words that I have spoken will line up of what God has spoken. Because many of the lies that I've spoken to can resonate and say, yes, what he said is true and it came to pass. That was a man of God. He was anointed and he was gifted. What are you saying, Carrie? Am I using my gifts and my powers for what God called me to use them for? Or am I just trying to get in where I fit in? Am I just simply trying to get in where I fit in? Because let me say this to you. When you have a gift and you have an anointing, it's going to ruffle some feathers because it's going to expose those who are just simply good. Why do you think people get jealous of you when you come on the scene and you haven't even done anything for them to be jealous of? It's because they recognize the anointing on your life and they know that you are the real deal. But if you show me up, then that means, oh, uh, so they got to first discredit you because they don't want you to expose them. Anybody hear that? We have to stop wondering, am I good enough? Baby, you were born for this. It's not about whether you're good enough. It's about whether you're walking in your purpose and authority. When you walk in your purpose and authority, you could care less if you looked apart because you're simply being what God called you to be. I've come to understand this. I'm simply carrying. And whatever comes out of my mouth, if it does what God called it to do and it's spoken by God, then I have no idea how it would impact the world. That's God's doing. I'm simply to be obedient and say what thus said the Lord. And that's it. Many people today are not doing what God called you to do because you have been told you're not worthy. You're dirty. You're nasty. You had a baby out of wet law. You had cheated on your wife. You did this. You got a criminal record. Well, last time I checked, when I read the Bible, most of them jokers in there had something they'd done illegally. Paul killing folks. Moses killing folks. David killing folks. Do I need to keep going? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Then we want to talk about uh, when, when, when Jacob and Esau was going on. The mama basically tricked the daddy, lied to him. They, 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 they pulled a, 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 what's the word I want to use? A covenant fraud. Yeah, covenant fraud. We'll call it covenant fraud. Where they had the fraud of frauding you know, Isaac to basically bless Esau, uh, Jacob with his, with his brother's birthright. What are you saying, Carrie? Throughout the Bible, it's not about good people doing great things. It's about a lot of criminals being changed by God. And they were still anointed for the purpose that God called them for, even though they were messy. See, nobody want to talk about that. We want to only look at, you got to look this certain way for God to use you. You got to be this certain way for God to use you. No, you just simply be who God called you to be and he will use you. I wish I could get some help in this morning. I'm trying to free you from the bondage of people that are telling you that God didn't call you to do what he called you to do. He, he, he called some of you right now to start a business, to, to run for the board uh, of directors in your city. He's called you to be on the board of directors, to be on the, the, the board of education in your city. You're anointed for that. You're called for that so you can help bring change to your community. You may never set foot in a pulpit, but that board of education will be the very pulpit that you set on because power comes with it to bring about change. So I want you to hear me this morning. It's not about you sitting in a pulpit and laying hands and slaying folks in the spirit and throwing them in. No, baby, that's not anointing. That's church-wise. You may be anointed to be the next president of this United States. You may be anointed to be the next governor of your, of your state. You may be called to be the mayor of your city. It can happen. Why? Because if you're called for it and set aside for it, when the time comes through your trials and tribulations and your hard times and circumstances, you are now been equipped with what, 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 what books can't teach. And that's the school of hard knocks. I wish somebody hear me this morning. You have much inside of you that is waiting to come forward, but you can't allow people to tell you that God can't use you because you don't look the part. 
Jesus didn't look the part, according to the scribes and Pharisees, and he had a little cult following him called the disciples. Y'all, let's just, let's just go there. Let's just be real about it. And so he spent most of his ministry fighting the church and their doctrines. And the very thing, oh, this is going to hurt. This is going to really hurt, but God, I hear you. The very thing that Jesus came to bind, we've made him. <laughs> Somebody don't want to talk to me. See, Jesus didn't come that he would be a, a exhorted and be considered worshipped. No, he came that we may have life in that more abundantly. And if you read the word of God, he was always calling the church dogs and vipers. And when, 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 when they found the lady in the act of adultery, they brought him for him and said, and he, you know, we found her in the very act. These are church folks always finding people in the very act of doing something wrong, then bring them before the church and exposing them. And Jesus simply said, you without sin cast the first stone. Why are you bringing all this up, Kerry? Because the very thing that Jesus fought against, we have made him. He's, he, he, come on. If you don't do it, I've heard him say, well, you don't accept him as your Lord and Savior, you're going to die. What? Jesus never taught that. <laughs> we have to stop it. You have been called by God for a purpose. There are giftings that he's given you that you need to use and use for the glory of God. If you in it, for people, you're going to be judged and crucified. But if you're in it for God, he would give you the grace and the mercy to cover you when you fall. He'll give you the grace and the mercy to cover you when you don't look the part, sound the part, smell the part, and you're not the part. But he knows that a time is coming where he is going to call forth your gift. And the efficacious call of grace is going to come forward and bring you forward. And when it does, all that he birthed you to go through, all that he birthed you for is now going to come to pass at this moment. And all that you went through was preparing you for such a time as this. That's why you must know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Being anointed sets you aside for a purpose and the gifting inside of you amplified by the anointing when the purpose is time to be fulfilled. So I want you to do what Christy has done right now. I want you to type on the screen, yes, I am his vessel. I want you to say that today. I want you to affirm it today that I am his vessel. No weapon formed against me shall prosper, even the weapon of education that tells me I'm not educated enough. Oh, that's a weapon. Sometimes not being educated in the man of God, in the, in the man of I, uh, in the in the men's eyes, is saying that God didn't do it. You must stop and say it today. You must stop and say, I am his vessel. I am his vessel. He has called me. He has birthed me for a purpose. He has not yet brought forward that all that I am to do, but I know all that I've gone through is for his total purpose. I am his vessel. And when you know what you know, nobody can tell you otherwise. It's like having a child out of wedlock and you know that's your daddy over there, but you can't tell him about that's your daddy because you know what to say that I'm, that's my daddy. It's going to make my daddy look bad. But if that's your daddy, it's your daddy, baby. Whether he has you in wedlock or out of wedlock, you better know who you are from. I am God's vessel and I may not look like it. I may not sound like it. I may not have the blue eyes like my daddy have. I may not have the long hair like my daddy have. But what I can promise you is his DNA is my DNA. And if you take a blood test, you'll realize that's my daddy. What are you saying, Carrie? You must stop letting people tell you you're not God's vessel. You are his vessel whether you're dirty or clean. You're still his vessel because here's the thing. The, pre the people that God has for you to deal with. Think about Jesus. Jesus didn't deal with the executives and the doctors and the lawyers. He dealt with those in poverty because he, God wanted him to go that direction. So what are you saying, Carrie? So if I don't have a church with 100,000 people, that means I'm not anointed or I'm not called? Uh, the contrary. I am called. Because you know why? Because it's not in a size that could cause you successful. It's in your purpose of fulfillment that makes you successful. Did I fulfill the purpose that God birthed me for? I'm his vessel. But a lot of times, if you don't know your purpose, and let's go back to Moses. Moses, 
being raised in the kingdom of Pharaoh, given the Egyptian knowledge, in position actually to be uh, next to his, 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 his stepbrother, so to say, Pharaoh as the successor. But he's not of the same. In other words, you'll find yourself in high positions in man's arena, but God can have a total arena for you to go in. And so he'll allow things to happen, put you in the wilderness, put you out there where nobody would recognize you. Nobody will appreciate you. He'll take you from the very thing that you used to know now to a place that I don't know. I'm talking to those this morning who found yourself in the wilderness when you accepted the purpose that God called you to be. See, when you accept God's purpose, it will throw you in the wilderness. I can't get any help today. It'll put you right smack dab in the wilderness because you know why the wilderness is the place of being lost, having to find your way, seeing, hearing strange noises, feeling strange things around you. It's out of your comfort zone. Anybody this morning feel like you're in the wilderness? That although you know you're doing what God called you to do, you find yourself in a place of unusualness that I'm, I'm not, I, I, I'm, I just feel like I'm lost. I'm feeling lost, but I know I'm doing what God called me to do, but I feel lost. Y'all better hear me this morning. You better hear me. Many of you are in the wilderness right now because God has shifted you out of uh, what's normal, put you in the wilderness because of where he's getting ready to take you to. And I got to strip you in the wilderness of all the confidence you had in man's point of view. And I need to equip you with the wilderness experience so that you'll have gratitude and understanding when I put you now deeper into your purpose. Look at the yeses that are coming on. People say, I feel like I'm in the wilderness. I feel like God has abandoned me. I feel like God has given me this, this ability to do, but yet now the ones that I used to look up to look down at me like I'm nothing, like I'm just lost. Can I get anybody's help this morning to say, Carrie, you're talking some good stuff, but you're not lost. Actually, you're found. Because now God is stripping you of all of that Egyptian knowledge, meaning the knowledge of man. And he's now saying, I'm getting to birth out of you that purpose I birthed you for. Remember those things that you wrote down 20 years ago that you didn't understand? Now I'm going to spring them back to you. Remember that saying that I gave you and the songs that I've given you? Remember the insight that I've given you? Remember the nights that I told you to write this down and write that down? Yes, now I'm getting ready to bring it out of you. Why? Because the wilderness experience was a stripping experience to prepare you for the purpose because your gifting now is being, to, being able to be amplified by the anointing and you're getting ready to do exactly what I birthed you to do, although you're called unworthy. And you know what? I love the underdog. I love the underdogs. I love the ones that don't look the part, that look like you're going to finish last place because, man, ain't nothing like blowing some minds of those who deem you unworthy. I'm hearing this this morning, that many of you are finding yourself in a wilderness experience. You're finding yourself saying, God, I know I, I did what you told me to do. I, you told me to do this, and you told me to do that. You told me to step out on faith. You told me, and he says, I sure did, and you did all of that. But I knew that I wanted you to step out of where you were in into this wilderness experience so that in this experience, I can now equip you for the promise that I have for you. And I couldn't equip you in the condition that you were in. So I had to get you to step out of your comfort zone into the wilderness that I may strip you and prepare you. And, and, and then what? Bring you before great men. Can I get an amen? I got to get out of here. My, my time is up, but I pray this is blessing you. Many are simply operating in gifts and not the anointing. And it's okay because your gifts are good. But I need the anointing that destroys the yoke. I need the anointing that activates my gift that when I move forward, I'm not just doing something, but I'm doing something that's going to bring about a change in this world. So this morning, those of you that are gifted, ask God to activate the anointing on your life that would activate the gift or gifts. And that's why I'm going to be honest with you. It's not that it's not that you're all that. It's just what God has anointed you to do. Only you can do. So stop saying, well, they already have somebody doing it. Well, that's them. But you are anointed for this. They were just gifted. And now your gifting will be activated by that anointing. And that anointing that God set you aside for this purpose will expose you to the world that will say, where have you been? And you'll say, I've been here all the time. 
But what you cannot do is allow them to make a God out of you once God brings forth your power and anointing. You have to simply say, I'm only doing what the Father called me to do. All right. Listen, I got to go. I got to go. Did this word bless you today? Did this word make you go, woo? Man, what in the world just happened? I feel like I feel empowered. I feel like I can just go and do all that God called me to do. Well, if you do, that's what I wanted. I wanted you to hear what thus said the Lord so that you can go forward. Let's pray. God, I glorify you. My God, this word is powerful. I glorify you for this word. I pray that everyone that is gifted but not anointed, that you would, God, if it's your will for this anointed vessel to come forward. If it's not that time, keep them where they are until it's that time. But activate the gifts with a greater anointing, fresh anointing. From the crown of our heads, God, let it pour fresh ideas that as it go to our feet, the energy and the know-how and the ability and the willpower and the, the zeal to do it. Say, so wherever our feet step upon, God, it's stepping with the anointing and it's stepping with power. Bless the ones that have heard your word, the words that have resonated in their spirit. Father, I don't know exactly what impact it will make, but you know, simply being obedient. And I ask and pray that the word touch your people. Bless them, cover them. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. I pray that this word has touched you in a mighty way. If you came in late, please watch it and, and go back and watch it, the replay and watch it in its entirety because I'm telling you something. This word this morning is deep. It is deep. It is. So listen, I want you to visit right now on the screen. I want you to go and sow a seed into this ministry. I want you to, if this word has blessed you, I want you to be a blessing to the ministry because we're looking to establish a location where we all can meet together. And we need your help in doing that. So if you will partner with us, you can go to the, um, in, in, in the comment section. I'm going to put it up again uh, where you can actually go and donate. But I want you to today, whether it's a dollar, whether it's a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, but whatever it is, we want you to be a blessing and donate that we may start to build this ministry and do what God has called us to do. Give me a second. I'm going to put it on the screen what, 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 what we need to do. I want you to do it. I want you to help. So it's coming right quick. Hold on right here. I got it. I'm coming. I want you to get this. I want you to be a blessing. People say, man, thank you. And you're welcome. But I want you to help us. I want you to help us by simply just donating. Because you know what? We need your help. It's just that simple. Take this word. Take it with you. Let it bless you. I promise you, if you listen to it again and again and again, it'll resonate even the more. 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 And you'll find yourself really walking in your purpose and calling. Many are simply gifted, not anointed. I want both. I want my gifts to be anointed and amplified. That's what I want.